Peterson. I serve on the Arizona Corporation Commission. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And I have with me Eileen Klein and Steve Pierce. We're working on his video right now, but good to see you both. Hello. Yeah. So this is our virtual happy hour. We plan to tell you a little bit more about ourselves and hopefully answer a bunch of questions that, that you might have. I know we've got a number of participants jumping on right now and wanted to just let those as they join know that we are recording this session. So I'll be putting it on my Facebook page, uh, Arizona Corporation Commissioner Facebook page a little later. Um, and that uh, we're also using this chat feature at the bottom of your screen. I know we're all becoming Zoom experts, but at the bottom you've got a little box that says chat. You can put any questions in there and, and Eileen and Steve and I will see that uh, and can answer any questions as we move forward. But I thought this would be a fun experience. Um, last week, Eileen and I did a virtual happy hour uh, and you learned more about me and a little bit about her. But I think a lot of people are curious about Eileen and Steve. <laughs> so I thought it'd be interesting to hear a little bit more about your background and then we'll certainly get into the role that I play at the Arizona Corporation Commission and can talk more about my campaign. Um, and I want to remind folks that are um, watching right now, you can always go to votefor.leah.com, which is there in, in the box in front of you, and uh, take a look at more information about me and my platform and so on as I run for re-election for the Corporation Commission. So shall we jump in and get started? Do it. Okay, so I thought we'd start with kind of talking about our backgrounds. Um, and Eileen, if you don't mind taking a few minutes and telling us more about you, I think people are really curious. <laughs> Well, first, thanks for the chance to get together. It's been really fun having these conversations with you, and I'm hoping tonight that people will chime in with what they want to know, both policy-wise and, of course, about you, because I think it's a fantastic forum just to get to know you better and also to pay tribute to all the important work you're doing at the commission. So a little about me, you know, Leah, we've gone back now, I, I want to say at least 10 years, when we first met and we kind of united around a common passion for the good of Arizona, but also around education issues in particular. I think maybe the first time I met you, I was in the private sector. So in the mid 2000s, I worked at United Healthcare first in government relations, then in operations. And before that I had been a legislative staffer for a number of years and was the head of policy at the House of Representatives, but went into the private sector, really thought that's where I would be staying. Of course, there's no end to interest and intrigue and, and the things you can learn in healthcare, and it really honed my, certainly my business acumen. I'm very grateful for that experience. But in 2009, many of you know that Governor Brewer called and asked if I would come and help out. At that point, she'd just become governor, and I remember Governor Napolitano had left for DC, Governor Brewer was Secretary of State, she became governor within just a matter of weeks preparation really. I initially helped with the transition thinking that would be my role and then ultimately she called and asked if I would come and serve and remember that was such a very challenging time for the state. Um, certainly only paralleled now by what we're going through so it'd be fun to talk a little bit about that tonight. That's how I got to know Steve. And uh, from there, wound up becoming her chief of staff and stayed there for about four years, after which I went to the Board of Regents. The president's role at the Board of Regents was open. The regents asked me if I would come over there and help with their repositioning in essence. They had seen what I had done, obviously, with the state and the universities had been hit hard, so it was a chance to go and help them figure out their path forward. So after five years of doing that, I was ready to take a break and I was really planning on taking a break and Governor Ducey then called and said, our state treasurer has left again for DC, the Lord of DC and Arizona leaders. I'm proud of how many leaders get plucked out of Arizona to go help on the national front. And our treasurer at the time, Treasurer DeWitt left to become the CFO of NASA. And Governor Ducey asked me if I would fulfill the role of treasurer and served out the remainder of that term. So that's that's kind of my path and how I've known you and Steve through this time. We can talk a little bit as we go along about, you know, kind of what we're up to now, but it's a good chance just to get caught up and reminisce a little bit about, about all we've had in common through the years and all the experiences we've shared. Yeah, I think you've had such an interesting background having worked with Governor Brewer and then certainly 
in the legislature and in private industry, border regents and treasurer. I mean, you've really seen so many different aspects of the state. So right. really appreciate your, your help with my own campaign and just being a, a good friend. I appreciate that. You bet, you bet. And then um, Steve, I know, I think we're having video challenges there, but if you could unmute yourself, that would be great. And would love to just hear more about your background. I know I've, I've known you quite a long time. Um, I'm, as many folks know, the former president of the Tucson Hispanic Chamber. I met you probably 10 years or, or more uh, when I was serving um, as the chamber president. So can you tell us more about your background? And you're still muted right now, Steve, if you could. Unmute, that would be great. Oops, maybe we're having some technical difficulties there. Well, while we, while we wait for Steve to, to jump in on the conversation, we should talk a little bit about how we, maybe the three of us got connected with you and this venture. You took on the role of corporation commissioner what, more than a year ago now, I guess it is, or about a year ago. Almost, yeah, about 11 right. months. And, and at the time you knew, oh, I think Steve's with us. So before we get too far into that, let's let him say hello. Hello, uh, if you can hear me, and I apologize. I have no idea. I'm very rural, so this is out in the sticks. And uh, my, Eileen has been here, so uh, my, internet is just not that great but uh it's a pleasure to be here with you even though you can just hear me it's probably better you can't see me anyways <laughs> no where are um, you right now steve you're in the prescott area right i'm 25 miles northwest of prescott and we have a uh, cell phone we're right in the edge of the closest cell phone tower so our reception and then our internet everything is just uh it, oh, it's did shaky lose you? so I, did you lose me? Please. Hello. I apologize I for this. I can't you. imagine. I hear you that. great. So, so keep on going. Okay. So, anyways, uh, I was first elected down there in two thousand and nine, and probably even worse than what's going on now, except there wasn't uh, the uh, deadly virus along with it, but. In the first two weeks of the session, Napolitano was still governor, and it took her a while to leave. Mm -hmm. And we were, we had to cut two billion dollars out of the budget in the first two weeks of the session. And I'm down there as a new legislator. I had no idea what was going on. It was, uh, it was a horrible time. Uh, Eileen was there. She knows about it. Um, John Arnold, and there's there are people still around. That, we're down there. Governor Brewer did a masterful job getting through that, and we um, we survived, just like we're going to survive now. Uh, yesterday we had a, a meeting that uh, on just like we are right now, and I said that I think uh, everybody needs to be prepared that we ha might have to go in and start cutting out of this fiscal year's budget right now. We don't know, right. and we won't know until June. So. Uh, I got to know Eileen at that time. Uh, she's been a good friend ever since. Uh, she became a cowgirl, rode in the parade with me twice. That's right. And, uh, and we've, um, we've been good friends. I mean, it's an honor to be uh, help, here to help you out, Leah. I think uh, you're doing an outstanding job and Southern Arizona needs representation on the Corporation Commission. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. And it's really been an honor to work with both of you, even more closely being on the Corporation Commission. And I froze there a little bit, so I, I came back. I know I missed some of Steve's introduction, but uh, I know a lot of his background, so I'm good. Um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about me for those that might be on the call that um, aren't as familiar. Uh, I have served, I mentioned, as president of the Tucson Hispanic Chamber for about 10 years. Um, prior to that, I'd, I'd been a small business owner, owning a chain of gas stations and convenience stores in Tucson in a business brokerage firm. So like Eileen, I've got that private uh, um, but in Cochise and in Santa Cruz County too, we actually worked with uh, economic development in Northern Mexico also. Um, and very proud that our Hispanic Chamber was named the Hispanic Chamber of the Year for the nation in 2013. 
because we grew from some 300 members to over 1,800 and formed a strategic partnership with Glenn Hammer at the Arizona Chamber really to, to build our influence and our voice from a Southern Arizona perspective. I think I've been pretty aware since of being even a business owner the last 20 years or so that we need to speak up as much as we can from Southern Arizona, from rural Arizona, and make sure that we're being heard, that bills and legislation have different impacts sometimes in different parts of the state. And it's important that legislators like Steve, uh, those that work within the administration like Eileen have, and now in my role at the Corporation Commission, that we're aware of the impact on all the different counties and so on. Um, after serving at the chamber for so many years, I decided to run for Congress in CD2. Um, really interesting life experience, raising money, reaching out to voters, talking to folks throughout Southern Arizona. And I was very proud to win my primary, uh, but unfortunately lost the general election. And I had then decided to leave the chamber and was going back into private industry, uh, doing a kind of public relations business development firm. When like Eileen, I also got a call from the governor and he said he would be um, very, very interested in appointing me to the Arizona Corporation Commission. Um, I was very honored that he thought of me. I, I'd heard of the ACC. I knew of people that had run before. I certainly did not know the complexity of the issues we were dealing with at the time, but did a lot of research and uh, told him I was ready to serve. Um, it happened very quickly, if you followed it. Um, and I, I replaced Andy Tobin, who I know Steve and Eileen know well, who is now the Director of Administration uh, for the Governor. And uh, within just days, Andy and I swapped places and I was uh, put in there at the Corporation Commission and kind of continued in his shoes. So, uh, and those are big shoes to fill. I really enjoyed the experience. Um, I'm a statewide commissioner. So though I live in Tucson and I'm the only commissioner not based in Maricopa County, um, I represent everyone in the state. And you might be wondering what is the Corporation Commission? And we regulate all the utilities. So. We have a role in making sure we have affordable, reliable, safe energy, whether it's electricity, water, gas, wastewater. Uh, we work somewhat in the telecommunications industry, so we've got to talk more about broadband out there in Prescott, Steve, <laughs> so we can see That's you on right. video. <laughs> yeah, That's right. we, we do business incorporation, we handle securities. So I think people are often uh, very interested, and I tell them the breadth of the issues that we're working with. At the Corporation Commission, there are five of us. Right now, there are four Republicans, one Democrat. Three seats are open, so I, as an incumbent, are running for one of those seats. Uh, we've got another incumbent running, and then a lot of other people who are trying to kind of get one, that additional seat, our chairman has, has termed out. Um, but prior to the COVID-19 virus, I was working my way around the state, working really hard to meet with folks in all 15 counties and and engage with people. I'm a Republican, so I was really uh, reaching out to a lot of the Republican clubs, Republican women clubs, when it all came to a halt, as we know, around the middle of March. Um, and now I'm trying to be innovative with uh, virtual town halls and reaching out to people on social media and email and so on. So would love to hear from you. If you're listening right now and have a question, you're welcome to put it in the chat and, and we can address that if you'd like. Is there anything I missed there, Eileen or Steve? I think, I think you I covered, covered a lot mostly. there. <laughs> we'll get into more. So I thought um, what we could do is talk a little bit more about each of your roles and kind of how we perhaps over, overlap a little bit. And, um, and Steve, I know you talked, and probably I was frozen on the screen for a minute, but about your leadership experience now and in the past. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and, and how you've come to represent your area of state uh, for such a length of time, how you kind of do that outreach to the voters? I was elected in 2009, as I said, and uh, I ran as a cowboy, not a politician, and that, that resonated with a lot of people. And um, when I got down there, all I did was try to help Bob Burns, that was the president of the Senate, all that I could, and make friends with people. And uh, I've learned way back that leading in the popularity contest, you got to get in there and do some work. And I think... Uh, the first six months there uh, in 2009, I was moved, I was elected to be uh, the whip because the, the whip that was there, Eileen would remember, but she, uh, well, long story short, she um, resigned and I was elected to be the whip. And I did that for a year and a half. 
And I think leading is like you do. I think you have to listen to people. You want to hear what people have to say. You want to let them feel like they're a part of the, the solution. And um, Eisenhower, I remember I used to tell people that he always said leading is an art um, to get someone else to do what you want done because they want to do it. And I think uh, that's the key to a lot of leadership. It's just not, you know, based on polling. You have to go in there and roll your sleeves up and there's hard decisions that you'll have to make with the corporate corp comp. And I think you so far have done a wonderful job. And I, as I said before, I think it's important that Southern Arizona is represented on that commission. So I, I'm proud to help you out all that I can. Um, I think that uh, Eileen and I are gonna do everything we can to help you get elected. And we would hope that everybody that's listening has sent in their $5 and helped you get your signatures that we have to accomplish. So um, that's really enough about me, I think. It's more about uh, you and um, I, I tell you right now, there's our legislators want to go in and do bills where I think that's totally wrong. We need to be worrying about the future of Arizona, saving lives, protecting the people and getting the economy back on track. It's going to be a real slow, difficult time doing that. But I think it's critical that, that uh, we address that. I know Governor Ducey will be working on it. And I know that the Corporation Commission will be working on it. And I know you're gonna be right in the middle of it. So uh, I think this is a very critical election I, and I'm glad to be here helping you out. Yeah, well, thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. And you're such a well-respected leader in the state and certainly in the legislature. I, I really appreciate your support. Um, I did wanna remind folks listening, cause I am a candidate. <laughs> I am a clean elections candidate. So really would appreciate if you would consider donating $5, which is the the max for the clean elections that I can receive. Um, it was important to me to run as a clean elections candidate so that I, I was really working for the voters, for the people around Arizona and not special interest groups. Unfortunately, when I joined the Corporation Commission, there was really this um, kind of cloud of corruption and stories of the past. And I just didn't want to be any part of that. So it's important to me to be clean elections. So you can go to voteforlea.com and donate $5 and please consider having your family and friends do so also because it's really changed campaigning in this virtual world of Zoom calls and, and emails and so on. But I did want to follow up on Steve's point related to economic recovery. I know right before we went live on this uh, Zoom chat, Eileen and I were talking a little bit about all the work happening throughout the state. And I had just hung up uh, from a phone call at the Arizona Commerce Authority, who is really trying to gather resources for small businesses. Um, they will be launching next week a daily small business boot camp focused on those with 20 employees or fewer. And I think that's important. Um, there's a lot of concern right now between the payroll protection program um, and the resources that provides a small business. Uh, who will who will survive, who will recover as a business after this. Uh, and I know throughout the state, we're seeing so many retailers, restaurants, bars, and on all industries really impacted. Um, from a corporation commission perspective, I've been really trying to get the word out to, for small business owners to work with their utilities. That we were, it, it was important to us at the CorpCon er, right early on, mid-March, to have a conversation with all the utilities and and get their commitment that they weren't gonna disconnect families and small businesses. Uh, there wouldn't be late fees. They would work out payment plans. And that they've all been doing a great job at that. So I'm just reminding small business owners and families to contact their utilities. The governor launched a website, arizonatogether.org, and all this different information is there related to unemployment, as well as utilities and telecom and so on. And, and I think that's a very important part to promote. And Eileen, did you wanna add anything to kind of economic recovery? I think there's so much for us to think about in terms of economic recovery, because what is so different about this circumstance is much of the impact is induced by the reaction, understandably, people wanted to make to keep people safe. And we are realizing many of the vulnerabilities we have along with some of the strengths. So in terms of Arizona, one thing I, I always think about, I'll never be able to not think about, is how our state is able to withstand 
any kind of shocks that come from the economy. And in 2009, things were bad in part, uh, not just because Arizona was so hard hit, the hardest hit per capita of any state in the nation in terms of the size of the deficit, but the immediate contraction of available revenues from the collapse of the real estate market and then everything else that went into the underpinnings of the finances in our state. And while in the past we'd all faced budget deficits before, that one was so different because at the time we were also grappling with a lack of cash. So because policymakers had delayed for so long, the very tough decisions, as Steve talked about earlier, that had to be made, the longer they waited, the worse the circumstance became. And one thing people don't realize is that when the legislature passes budget bills, it's not just a matter of allocating the amounts, but that's law. And so until someone comes in and changes the law about the spending patterns and the spending priorities, the state stays on autopilot. So as treasurer, I got to experience that firsthand. But in 2009, what we faced was not just a budget crisis of 40%, which is hard to imagine, but we had no cash. And that meant we were on the verge of not being able to make payroll, making payments to contractors, including prison contractors. And so it was a very challenging time. What I'd like to say is in contrast now is that certainly we have better footing. The state has cash. There's been a very deliberate effort on the part of the governor. And thanks to the efforts of leaders like the two of you at the time, insisting that we do things better going forward, the state is better prepared. But our, our economy, you know, the economic recovery, obviously, I think will happen quickly once we're reopened. I think now that our hospitals can do other emergent, you know, very medically necessary services that were curtailed for a while, I think bringing that back will certainly help. That's a huge impact on local communities, particularly rural communities. Saving the schools, keeping our schools going was really important. Those are things that we can make our way through, but kind of have a safety net beneath them in terms of being a sector, as painful as it is right now. That's a big contrast to before. So to, to me, the big opportunity is, what are we gonna do with this going forward? You know, we've got huge opportunities for change coming out of this. Now that people are accustomed to working a little differently, not making the drives, thinking differently about how their kids get educated. I'm kind of excited about all the opportunities we can bring out of this. And I hope that our return to normal, to normal life, will not be the return to status quo because I think we'd really be changing ourselves with a lot of growth opportunities. Yeah, I think you're right. I think I'm hearing a lot of the, the buzzwords around how you're gonna pivot your business, the new normal and so on. And I think we're seeing just the, the advance of technology so quickly. Uh, even in Zoom calls like this and how people are, are doing work globally with the use of technology, it's going to, I think, speed up much faster than we had thought in the past. Um, we have a question from somebody here. I think I have a question. <laughs> Address my position on renewable energy. What's my timeline for moving to renewables, percentages, clean energy, and so on? So good question. Thank you for asking. So in my 11 months now, at the Corporation Commission, I have been hearing of a lot of new technologies and certainly studying the issues related to clean energy. And Arizona really has a benefit in our nuclear energy, which is clean, um, and it provides almost 25 to 35, 30 percent of our energy mix in the state of Arizona. Uh, just at the beginning of March, our Corporation Commission hosted a, uh, a workshop on energy rules. Um, we knew we needed to make updates. It had been a long time since Arizona had addressed our renewable energy standard, which is at 15%, and we needed to, to take some action. Um, what is a little challenging is at the same time having the energy rules workshop, we'd also had a workshop just a few weeks prior on retail competition. To me, when you really lay those out, those are really parallel issues. Um, so I was fully supportive of moving forward with energy rules. We heard from a lot of different stakeholders. Um, I came out with an announcement uh, just a, a week after that, right at the beginning of this COVID-19 crisis, uh, stating my support for 100% clean energy for the state of Arizona by 2050. And I stated it that way because I think a lot of people heard from APS in the Phoenix area that they had supported 100% energy by, or clean energy by 2045. But you think as corporation commissioners, we're not stating a goal for one company by utility. We're doing this for the entire state. 
And Tucson Electric Power has a much higher dependency on coal. They need more time to extract themselves from that. Um, when I asked and did research, it seems like the final coal plants will close around 2040, uh, based on the projections before this crisis. So it seemed reasonable to me to set a goal of 100% uh, clean energy by 2045, 2050, excuse me. Um, when people have asked what renewable energy, what role that plays, I absolutely think Arizona uh, is, should be the leader in the nation on solar energy. Um, but I also realize, having learned more about um, energy in my 11 months on the commission, that there's so many new technologies um, and new uh, innovative projects that people are working on, whether it's fusion or hydroelectric and uh, you know, wind in New Mexico, and I know there's so many different projects that folks have come before our commission with, and I'm fully supportive of that, but I'm also very wary of picking winners and losers uh, this far out, not knowing what technology is coming. So if you've watched any of the commission meetings, if you've seen how I've reacted, um, I am trying to do thorough research, have it based on data, um, and then also have a reasonable approach to so many of these very complex issues. Um, my hope was that our my fellow commissioners would support that first kind of umbrella step of 100% clean energy by 2050, right at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, so that we would have time to work through energy efficiency and renewable standards and other pieces of that. Um, you asked about timing. Originally, before the crisis, we were planning to talk about it again in June, July. I don't know now. Um, we have about 42 rate cases, I believe, that we were supposed to tackle before the end of the year. Um, I just filed a letter in the docket, which is like an online folder, how we operate at the Corporation Commission, um, that really spoke about the workload on our staff. And now that we're working remotely, I want an understanding of extensions that are needed. Can we continue at the same pace? How will the community engage with each of these rate cases? So all of that's happening at the same time as our energy rules, which I think is first and foremost, um, an economic benefit to the state of Arizona. Um, and I'll kind of end with all the states around us have set uh, these clean energy goals and many of them have set renewable goals. Arizona looks very behind in the times by having out there just the 15% renewable energy standard. So I think that um, going 100% clean energy makes sense. I think my fellow commissioners support that. We just need to vote on it, make that official, and then move forward with other component parts of it. Um, if you have information you'd like to share with me on your own opinion, you're welcome to go to azcc.gov, which is the Corporation Commission website. My picture's right there. If you click on it, it emails me directly, but would love to hear from you if you have your opinion. So, uh, I think that's such a great, a great point. Uh, I think it often comes down to this renewable energy conversation always seems to come down to, do you support mandates or do you not support mandates? I think in part because getting to the original 15% goal was very controversial. And there were a lot of complaints that companies were forced to it. And we all know, you know, there's a, you know, you, you want to lead, sometimes you need a nudge, you need a push. And so I guess the mandates in the eye of the beholder. So tell us a little bit about what, what you think about mandates. What's the difference between just a hard and fast mandate on portfolios versus what you're suggesting to move companies into planning? Yeah, and that's a, a good question. So you're right, at the time that that 15% renewable standard was put in place, they needed to push and to create that incentive. Um, however, at this point, solar energy costs have gone down dramatically. Um, I was very proud to support an initiative uh, that changed our PURPA rules, which is like the federal timeline for uh, renewable energy developers in order to get their return on investment in the state kind of wonky, I can tell you more, but it was originally just at a couple of years and, uh, and I led and with the support of my fellow commissioners, we moved it out to 18 years. What that means is we're so much more attractive to energy developers that are looking around the country. We're a place that they're gonna look to to perhaps bring this renewable energy to utility scale or whatever it may look like uh, to the state of Arizona. 100% um, clean energy encompasses renewable energy. So I am supporting a goal. Um, I'm just not, again, kind of picking, it must be this, it must be that, because what do I know, you know, so many years from now, 2050 is a long way away. Um, I am supportive. The staff has put out different positions on our integrated resource planning, which is kind of what the utilities go through every so many years in terms of 
planning and projecting. I would like to see that stepped up and, and um, be more um, accountable to some of the data and have community input. Um, so I do think that uh, goals along the way will make sense, but I don't want to stifle, I guess, innovation and technology. So I'm kind of still working my way through what number, what percent. Um, during the energy rules workshop, if anybody watched online, because you can see all of our meetings online, I expressed a lot of frustration that at the end of that workshop, we had had data that conflicted. We had stakeholders saying it means A and another saying it means B. Um, and I said, well, I, I want time to research this. I want to read through this material so that I'm setting a pace for Arizona that makes sense for the ratepayers, that it's affordable, because we could be 100% clean energy tomorrow if we're all willing to pay for it, right? But it needs to be something that's balanced between that affordability and then it's certainly the, the positive impact on the environment. That's great. And we have another question on here. Oh, from Maria. Says, with so many people unemployed and so many small businesses closed, would it be possible to put all rate increases on hold for a period of time? I mean, that's a, a good question, Gloria. I think um, one of the challenges we have is as a corporation commissioner, we are constitutionally required to make sure that their utilities are getting a just rate of return. So a lot of those rate cases have been uh, voted on and passed, and they're projected to uh, make a certain amount of money over a period of time and get made whole in terms of the investments they've made. When a utility company makes an investment, it's long term. It could be five, 10 years out from now. But I, I will tell you, in a recent staff meeting we had, we did have talk about, let's pull all the surcharges that show on your bill. So if you pulled up your bill, there's a number of different surcharges. Let's study those. What can change? Um, we had a commissioner ask about, uh, could we set a kind of emergency tariff that if there were a case like this, that all utilities would go to a certain um, rate, uh, like a, a flat rate or something of that nature. Um, and we were told at the time by the staff that would require a rate case. So I will tell you, Gloria, we are poking around at that. We are looking at um, what uh, can be done uh, immediately because that's people are suffering right now and people, the unemployment has grown so dramatically. It's we again had them commit not to disconnect families and businesses, not to charge late fees, workout payment plans. Um, and I think that's something I want to just push and, and tell people about. Governor Ducey has been very, uh, he's promoted quite a bit that folks can't get evicted right now. And I think that's great. And I think they need to have some certainty around um, not seeing, uh, you know, facing a burden because of the utility bills. Um, so we are taking a look at uh, rates, certainly. Anything, Eileen or Steve, you want to it's, add? It's a great question, and I can understand why it's top of mind. I'm wondering, can you talk to us a little bit about your thoughts on the availability of assistance for people? So I'm hoping the utilities, you can tell us, do you think the utilities are doing enough on their own to make sure that people are going to make it through without the threat of losing services? And then secondly, what what should we know about what assistance is out there? Good question. So I think the utilities are doing a lot and are very supportive of utility assistance programs, but more can always be done. I don't think any of us projected the number of families would have the need right now. Um, and I'll tell you, there's an organization that we work with closely at the Corporation Commission called Wildfire. And Wildfire uh, receives the funds from the utilities and the federal government and then disperses it out among the 15 counties through the community action centers. So I'm in Pima County, I live in Tucson, and I know the Pima County Action Center has been working with thousands of families uh, working on utility assistance. Um, some um, challenges is they went remote themselves, but I think that that's been smoothed out now, and there are a lot of agencies able to help. But again, it's not enough. I mean, I, I'm sure people could utilize a lot more assistance um, if you live in the Phoenix area, you're probably also familiar with um, a lot of disconnect moratorium that we put in place this past summer. Um, I think we're still determining what was the financial impact to that, how many people have paid their debt now that they're through that, um, and what impact will that have on everyone else's bill if we have a large amount of bad debt. So there's a lot of questions to that, but I think utility assistance is something we need to advocate for more. Uh, from the federal government. The program's called LIHEAP, Low Income Heating and 
uh, energy program, I believe. Um, we have another $16 million coming to the state of Arizona, which is great, um, but we could always use more. Where's the 16 million coming from? Perhaps they'd like to know that. Yeah, it's coming from the, I think it's a Department of Energy program through LIHEAP, which is L-I-H-E-A-P. Um, and that comes through to Wildfire, who then disperses those dollars uh, to, through the various community action centers. I think a lot of those, the question that was just asked, that's an excellent question, but I believe that when we see what the numbers are, which won't be until June from JLBC and see what April looks like, uh, that will affect not only the Corporation Commission, but I believe there'll probably be a special session along at that time. And we're going to have to go in as legislators and deal with it. And I would guess the Corporation Commission is probably going to have to follow suit. Mm -hmm. Is that your opinion or am I way off base? No, I mean, we have um, continued to meet. We are doing it virtually through WebEx or like Zoom calls um, and having special meetings and addressing each of these issues. So I think we'll be prepared to help also if you come back together as a special session. Um, we're working right now, you know, the hundreds of rate cases we have in a year and another, I think, 42 coming for the end of 2020 and what kind of impact that will have as well as, you know, we have heard complaints, people saying, I'm on a uh, demand rate base or their peak rates. Uh, I know Eileen, you said you'd heard some from your neighbors and so on. We're, we're trying to understand the impact of everyone staying home. The energy use has flattened in many cases because you're home and you're using it throughout the day, but we also don't have a lot of these large businesses utilizing it like they did in the past. So what does that mean to each utility? What, what does that do to uh, energy demand for TP or APS or electric co-ops that are in our rural communities. Um, we're still determining that. And that's actually another letter that I put in uh, to the docket at the ACC asking for a special accounting order so that they could be tracking what's the financial impact. Because by June or whenever you might have a special session, Steve, for us to be able to uh, pull that data from our utilities would be very, very helpful. Um, I don't know if we'll have the data by then, but that was my question and, and my request of uh, the different utility companies that we regulate. I think that's a good answer because we don't know what the future is going to be. We have no idea right now uh, when we're going to be able to get the state open again, entirely open. We don't know what it'll be like. We don't know how many businesses are going to be filing bankruptcies. Uh, there's going to be a whole new world out there as soon as... Um, we can get lots of this stuff behind us. Um, and your campaign is much more difficult for you because you have to do it this way. You can't go out and raise funds and meet people and shake hands. It's just, uh, it's gonna be a very different year. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I should put the plug in, if you like what you're hearing and you can support my campaign, I sure would appreciate it. I'm. Uh, asking folks to donate $5 per registered voter in their house, any party, uh, to my uh, Clean Elections campaign, which you can see the website there. It's voteforlea.com. I sure would appreciate your support. Well, I have to give you, you I have to give you so much credit, Leo, because you were, I think, the one of the only candidates to come through the initial filing period for signatures without challenge. And I know how hard you worked, and I, I know how proud Steve and I are to be helping with this effort. And I hope people here can really appreciate how thoughtful Leah is, how much she has studied right away the issues, but not waited. I mean, she's gotten right to work. And so I think it's really important to go back to what Steve talked about earlier about uh, getting involved, that leadership isn't just a matter of understanding what might be popular, but really evaluating what's in front of you and having the courage to make the right decision. One thing I think all three of us have in common is we've been appointed to, to roles at certain points. You two obviously have run for, for roles. And I will never forget, you know, Senator John Kyle, as I talked earlier, we have all these phenomenal leaders from Arizona. And it's no small thing to be, to be the whip of the US Senate. And John Kyle said to me once, you know, Eileen, it's, it's the yes vote that's the tough vote. That's the courageous vote. It can be very easy to say no. And so I think, you know, put, putting thought into things and then having the courage to support it, and then even more so to go back and course correct, 
along the way is really important as you learn more. So that's one thing that I really value about each of you. One thing I was hoping as we get a, another question from folks who are online here is maybe you two can tell us a little bit about what is the difference between the legislature and their purview and the Corporation Commission and what they're responsible for. They're both constitutional entities. They're both a big deal. Nobody knows that much about the ACC, but what do you do, Ver Leah, versus what do you do, Steve? Go ahead, Steve. You can. <laughs> You've had more experience. Well, well, the legislature passes the laws. Uh, the governor signs the laws. Uh, the judges enact the laws, and the corporation commission is over there watching that the utilities are um, managed well, that there's going to be electricity when people get up every morning, that there's going to be water, there's the things that they manage, and it's, uh, it's a critical part of everybody's everyday that they really don't know too much about. And I think that uh, they don't even realize there's so many co-ops that you all look after also. It's not just uh, Tucson Gas and Electric and APS, you have lots of others that you manage and lots of other jobs that are done there. Um, I think at some point, somebody ought to take a look at what all you have to do, plus what does the Secretary of State's office do, and there are um, some crossovers there that I think could be made simpler and put more time for you to spend on utilities like uh, you're supposed to be. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good point. I, I uh, realized early on as I went to speak at chambers and Kiwanis groups and rotaries, people really have no idea what the Corporation Commission yeah. does. And one example is when I'm in Phoenix, most people think all we do is APS all the time, but there's so many electric companies, including our electric co-ops in rural Arizona, there, we regulate more than 350 water companies in the state. About 260 or so of them are very small, mom and pop, like D and E size is what we call them. A through E is kind of the, the classification. And I've, I've worked a lot with the smaller water companies. That, that resonates with me coming from a chamber of commerce. I realize that some of them have been generational and inherited by grandkids where grandpa started it when he was a developer, you know, 50 years ago, whatever it was. But the way in which their rate cases are handled, their capital investment concerns me in the state of Arizona. And I've been hold, holding listing sessions and public meetings and speaking to my fellow commissioners about how we need to uh, tweak the system in which we work with some of our very smallest companies. Um, we also have telecom, and it's more complex because FCC at the federal level manages their pricing, um, but we manage a lot of their, um, uh, the landlines and so on, and the infrastructure throughout the state. Um, most folks don't realize that we are a body of five, so there are five of us. So that means that with three votes, we can take action. Right now, the state legislature, you need many more votes. Um, so it's a whole different... Um, effort and we the decisions we're making at the Corporation Commission much like at the state legislature are impacting every family every business out there um, if you think about the utility industry there are monopolies in nature so wherever you live you don't get a choice on electric company or water company it's based on your address and who's got that um, that CCNN or that it's like a like a licensing right to that area that we approve um, and that makes it entirely different. It means that we're putting regulations and policies in place to ensure that Arizonans are taken care of and that, again, that it's affordable. Well, we have a great follow-on question to that, even better than what I just posed. Someone writes, hi, Leah, I'd really like to know why you think Governor Ducey chose you for this important role and what your relationship has been like with our other important state agencies, such as DEQ, the Department of Environmental Quality, Department of Ed, and the State Land Department. How do you see the role of the Corporation Commission in, in comparison to the other state agencies? And do you think it should do more to try to work with our other state leaders? Great question. That is a good question. Um, I, I, I've known Governor Ducey for quite a long time. And when he was our state treasurer, um, he came out quite a bit to work with our Hispanic chamber and spoke to our members quite often. 
Um, when he ran for governor, um, I got involved and supported him and also served on his transition team mm -hmm. and helped co-chair economic development, trade and tourism as he transitioned into his role as governor. So had had a, a lot of experience and seen his leadership style, especially coming from private industry. Um, he had endorsed me when I ran for Congress and, and saw my campaign um, very close up uh, and Senator Kyle actually also, which was such an honor. So I think he knew that I would bring a very different perspective to the Corporation Commission. You think I'm the only one not based in Maricopa County. I think he knew I would not shy away from running even though it's statewide and people typically not in Maricopa County have a tougher time winning statewide seats, but I plan to prove them wrong. <laughs> Uh, he also knew I was going to come at this position from a small business kind of entrepreneur perspective. Um, I believe I'm the only commissioner with small business ownership experience, or at least recently. I'm also the only commissioner that's not been a state legislator or in political office. So um, three of them have been state legislators and one has been a mayor. Um, and then there's me. So. I believe that I, I work very closely with the community. Um, I've made a point to do outreach and call and explain what we do in the court prom and really try to engage uh, citizens throughout the state, realizing we are in a statewide role. I'm also very sensitive to the fact that, you know, not everything is Phoenix based. We have so much more going on in the state and we really need to have that balance. Um, your question related to other state agencies is interesting. I've had many meetings with uh, Director Cabrera, who leads our Department of Environmental Quality. Um, some of it was educational at the beginning. I understood, because I was interested in water companies, that ADEQ handled the quality of the water. Um, ADWR kind of handled uh, the, the quantity of the water, and we handled the distribution of the water, just to simplify it. And I did not see a lot of overlap or interconnection. So I hosted a public meeting in probably February where I went through the 70 small water companies that were D's and E's that had not had a rate case since 1999 or earlier. Wow. And people would think, great, you know, no rate increase. But the flip side of that is what, what about capital investment and ensuring that we have the quality of water and that when you turn that spigot on, water is gonna come out and it's gonna be clean and good for your family. So thankfully, ADWR and DQ joined me at the table we went one by one, it was very tedious, but through those 70 water companies to understand the, the point we're at. Another particular interest I've also focused on is broadband access uh, to underserved areas. I'm actually was appointed uh, by the National Association of Regulator, Regulated Utility Commissioners, NARUC it's called, this national task force, but it was in January, right before the crisis really peaked. Um, and as the crisis hit, this issue of broadband access was even more escalated and places like Prescott where Steve's from and, uh, and the tribal communities and a lot of rural Arizona have challenges at broadband access and it really impacts the, the uh, economic empowerment of that zone. So I've been working since the crisis on a statewide task force uh, that includes the Department of Education because now that we are all working remotely, we're e-learning, I'm in Tucson, I know Eileen's in Phoenix. We're gonna take it for granted that we have internet access and you can buy a different package if you need more and you can afford that, but not everyone has that um, opportunity. So we're working on uh, supporting the governor's effort in putting fiber optic along our highways out to rural Arizona, distributing hotspots, finding additional funds. Uh, one thing a lot of people don't know is uh, that the Corporation Commission has also had a role in the Universal Service Fund, which is a line on your cell phone bill. So there's money that is utilized from that to help advance landlines in rural Arizona. So I've been getting more involved in that and understanding how we can help the Department of Education. Um, the State Land Department, I know Lisa Atkins, who leads that, um, she's been an incredible champion of um, helping this broadband access effort, working with uh, the Arizona Commerce Authority. So I've reached out to her and certainly wanted to help in any way that I could be helpful from the court prom. Um, so I, I really am realizing we are a judicial slash legislative body at the Corporation Commission. So it's a little different. The state agencies work directly for the director and then through the governor. Um, so it's a little different in terms of how we uh, work through items and how we, uh, I guess, move forward and, and take action. But I'm trying to be very collaborative and if, if 
you're on this call and you've worked with me in the past, you know that I tend to try and do outreach and be as collaborative as possible. Right, that's I think been a, an early hallmark of your leadership in the Corporation Commission, longstanding hallmark of you as a leader, but important to see that and I think connecting people to the very important decisions that are going to be made going forward really matter. We hear a lot about whether the corporation commissioner should be appointed. You know, early on, we think the corporation commission was a constitutional separated body simply because utility infrastructure was so important, it's only going to be more important. And let's talk now a little bit. We've got a, another good question from someone who's writing to ask a little bit more about the corporation commission itself. You know, these are very technical, complex cases you deal with. So let's talk about this. The question is, Leah, what, if any, role do the commissioners have in managing the staff, hiring and firing, for example? It seems that from listening to the open meetings that you commissioners have next to no influence on the staff, but you rely on them heavily in your deliberations. The relationship seems odd to me. I'd like to see it improved. So, Leah, what do you have to say about that? Tell us how it does work. Yeah, you know, and I was certainly trying to better understand this my first couple months at the position. Now, one, one thing people don't often realize is because we're in elected and appointed positions, we have open meeting rules. So that means if we're having a challenge or a debate, I cannot pull my fellow commissioners together in a room and hash it out. That's not allowed legally. We have to do it through these online dockets. Um, and because of that, it pre creates a lot of um, uh, necessity to, to lean on our staff at the ACC to do our research and to bring us data and information and make recommendations so that we can take action. So we have a couple hundred, but I believe uh, staff through all the different divisions at the Arizona Commerce, uh, Arizona Corporation Commission. And then we as commissioners each have two staffers that assist us uh, in meeting with constituents and drafting letters and so on. The staff of the divisions work for the executive director, which is hired by our chairman of the board uh, with support from our commissioners. So I think legally we may have a role in hiring and firing, but I think how it has worked in the past, so I'd have to research this. But at this point, I think any feedback I provide on a particular staff would go through the executive director, and then he would take you know, action on their performance. And it, to me, it's very similar to how we worked at the Chamber of Commerce on a much smaller scale. Uh, the board of directors hired me as the president CEO, and then I hired and worked with the staff. So certainly had input from the board of directors. And so that's how I've been moving forward uh, with the ACC. And I think the staff has been very helpful. I mean, they've got five different commissioners, very different personalities, different opinions. We're trying to decipher and look through these very complex issues and rely on the staff to give us the right data and the right information. Um, and some of our commissioners have been at it much longer and I'm a newbie at 11 months. Um, so, get, you know, learning as I go, but um, the staff has been very helpful. We've got just a few more minutes, it looks like. Time is flying. Um, wanted to ask, uh, I guess from Steve, from your perspective, what I've seen at the Corporation Commission is I feel like Arizona really has an, a rural slash urban divide. Um, I hear a lot from folks in rural Arizona about economic development um, challenges that they have, and so much is centered around Maricopa County. Do you hear that too, or... or uh, what do you think about that since you're really representing a rural district? Uh, that's very true. Uh, very often, it's just this great state of Maricopa that runs everything down there. But there are times when Pima County will join rural Arizona and say, you know, we need to do this or that. Now, rural Arizona, um, our roads are bad. Our roads are terrible. It, and it takes, a, it's a huge investment to go from Prescott to Phoenix or it, to anywhere. There's miles and miles you have to travel. Well, just the same as the utilities that uh, it took to run electricity out here to where I am, they, there's 25 miles of, of power lines that they got to run out here. Now, it, as the area grows, there's more and more people that tap into it, but it's a huge investment for in my case, APS, but it's the same for all of the power companies or co-ops. And it's, um, it's more, more to it than people realize. And I think that uh, having somebody from Pima County on the commission 
is really important to everybody in Maricopa County and everywhere else to bring in an I, the different ideas. So you can bring in that uh, what's happening in Pima County, what's happening in rural Arizona, where otherwise all they talk about is uh, what's going on between Peoria and Mesa and uh, whatever's going on in Maricopa County. Yeah, so I'm uh, right. e elated and the state should be, huh? No, I, th I think the, you're the right. The state should be. Go ahead, Steve. Well, uh, everything's delayed here from me. So anyways, I think it's, uh, it's wonderful to have somebody on there and somebody that's knowledgeable um, about Pima County and have someone there representing uh, that part of Arizona. And I know you look out after rural Arizona too. So uh, think of the expense of putting power lines from Prescott or from uh, Phoenix or up to the four corners, wherever the power comes in from. Uh, there's enormous investments. And then if you go down towards Gila Bend and see what's been going on when the APS has put in all the uh, solar plants down there. And are they a partner, I think, in, in that? Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but um, the, the APS has been putting in smaller solar plants uh, all over the state. There's one out in Prescott at the end of the airport. Um, there, if you go driving around, you'll see things that APS is doing all over the state uh, in their districts. So um, I, I'm just happy to be uh, here with you and representing you because uh, you're going to be doing a great job for southern Arizona and rural Arizona, which we need dearly. No, thank you, Steve. And I know there have been a couple of issues. There have been a couple issues in front of the Corporation Commission directly benefiting rural Arizona. And I, I really feel like I've been able to be a champion for them. Uh, one, we just voted on this last month in Mojave County, actually, is around uh, a, a electric co-op actually providing broadband fiber options. Well, that's an unusual thing for an electric co-op to engage in, but things, the resources are different in rural Arizona. This is something that their members, because a co-op's like a credit union, right? They're members of it. Um, and we're very, very supportive. And we heard a lot, a lot of very positive comments from Mojave County. So I was very proud to vote on that. Um, I also voted to support an effort in Graham County, which is out on the east side of Arizona. And uh, they were going to do small business lending through USDA grants. And again, unusual spot for an electric co-op to be in, but they don't have the financing infrastructure Phoenix and Tucson have. And their members supported them providing small business assistance. And I thought that was a great idea. It's also something that I supported. But I think I'm, I'm again, bringing that different perspective. And, and I'll kind of lead into this last question I see here on kind of why do I want this position? Seems so complex is what uh, someone's asking. And, I'll tell you that I think I have a history of really serving uh, the area in which I am representing. So whether it was the Hispanic Chamber or running for Congress at the time, but at the Arizona Corporation Commission, I really enjoyed uh, bringing my experience, my perspective in serving uh, the citizens of Arizona. Um, I feel like I'm an open person and I'm willing to listen and take in their uh, position and their opinions, and then uh, very proud to be able to represent and have that important vote on the ACC. So love Arizona, I've been here almost my entire life, and so want to continue to serve and hope you'll support me, those on the call today, and donate $5 to my clean elections campaign, because um, I am running clean elections again to ensure that, you know, I'm, I'm working for the voters of Arizona, not special interest groups, and you can donate at voteforlea.com, because I am trying to campaign virtually uh, through this crisis, which has uh, always been very tough. Well, I, I think in our last minute, I just want to thank you again, Eileen and, and Steve for joining me today. It means a lot to have your support in this upcoming election and maybe we'll just continue to do this. This is fun to talk about issues. You bet, thank you. You bet, anytime, thanks for asking. Thank you both and thanks again to all the participants today and. Uh, we will be, we recorded this, so we'll be putting it on our Facebook page too if you want to send folks to listen to it later. Thanks again, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.